Hello. <laughs> so um, I've worked in the field for about 10 years. I started out as an intern at Middlesex Health and then worked up in the manager. Um, the, I think the challenges, you know, the pandemic bought a, a few different challenges, one of which is, you know, the, the great resignation and, and retention issues. So uh, we kind of went through a, a bit of a hiring spree, if you would, of, you know, frequent, uh, you know, rotating uh, positions of BMAT ones to people who didn't want to work in during the pandemic, all of a sudden who did. And, um, you know, we, we had used HTM jobs uh, assistance in, in trying to fill some of those roles. But some of the challenges that we saw and some of the things that we tried to do to overcome them or lessons learned, I figured are, are worth sharing um, and help prevent other people from making our, our same mistakes. So in summary, what I'm gonna go over is, uh, we're gonna go through a poll just to get an idea of where everyone sits on a few different issues, uh, some consequences of, of what a staffing shortage can lead to, uh, anticipated growth of the field, why are staffing shortages more common now versus before, uh, and review the data uh, and job title and consistency. So I did a, uh, a research on uh, close to 400 po job postings in February to just get an idea of what we're seeing for, for titles and, and some of the challenges that I experience and does that exist with other locations uh, and why that actually adds to the problem and then talk about some best practices that I learned about um, and some specific findings that um, were kind of odd in, in the data set and then suggestions for current and future postings. So uh, just show of hands, uh, on average, how long has it taken uh, you to fill uh, recent job vacancies, whether it was you filling them or your employer? Uh, one to three months, okay. Uh, three to six, okay. Six to nine, greater than nine months. Okay, all right. Have you had to change the job posting to find more candidates? Anyone, yes? <laughs> okay. Have you needed to use a recruiting service? Yes, show of hands. Okay. Um, and the jobs that you have at your institution, are they level specific? jobs? Yes? Okay. All right, so some consequences of staffing shortage. Um, what you'll find is turnaround times are going to uh, definitely be impacted. They're, it's going to increase. You're going to have to prioritize your work a little bit better with, you know, do more with less, right? Um, and it's not so much do more, it's do what you were previously doing with less. Um, Compliance challenges, so it's greater difficulty um, getting your, your plan maintenance done. Um, and then less time spent documenting. Um, when staff are under pressure, they're going to find ways to, to just focus on the repair, get the job done, right? Uh, frequently, some of my techs will tell me, you know, how much time do you want me sitting at my desk when I got repairs piling up over here? Or I got PMs that I gotta go and do, Michael, just, you know, let me be. Uh, but the documentation is important. It, it poses co compliance challenges, right? Uh, staff burnout. Um, and we can use this as an open discussion too. So if anyone has any questions, you know, certainly pitch in. Because now, instead of me having people to do mm -hmm. all these things, for payroll, it's going to be the staff. You're absolutely right. <laughs> yep. And staff burnout also will, will happen. I mean, you're going to be asking your staff to do a lot of effort. Uh, to try and do what was previously being being done by your your other you know staff that were there, they have to now pick up more, um, and it might be even something that they might consider beneath them. It might be something uh, you know you're asking your rad tech to now go and change batteries on thermometers because I need someone to do it. Yeah. You also know what you can get. And sometimes those things are, yeah, sometimes they're not aligned. So Correct. That creates a whole new problem set. Correct. And, you know, need for persistent overtime, which does add to that cost and it adds to that burnout. So, uh, direct patient care impact, uh, missing plan maintenance that should have been done, uh, that could lead to failures that could exist on patients. Longer turnaround times could also lead to equipment not being available for patient care. If you got pumps that are lining the, the shop up, 
you know, those pumps are needed um, for patients. Uh, rushed work could also lead to mistakes. If staff feel incredibly under pressure, they might be cutting corners. They may uh, think they did something, get pulled away on another uh, job and come back to it and not pick up where they actually left off. That, these are real safety issues that can happen. We're only human. changes we had to make while we use the D, one of the mm -hmm. changes that we had to make was a uh, vaccine because what we were what was happening we had some great candidates but they were the people who got let go by hospitals because they didn't get a vaccine yeah and so you know it's again we we don't want to waste time with people that we can't vaccinate because our customers will they won't use us anymore if we're not vaccinated well and, and that's a great point and that kind of adds a whole nother layer to it um, we saw vendors that we actually couldn't have come and service our equipment anymore because they didn't have any staff that were vaccinated. So that added that it wasn't wasn't us losing staff; it was us losing contracted staff at that point, right? Yeah, yeah. So it, it creates a challenge. But then there's a, the financial costs associated with all of this. So, like you mentioned, cost goes up. You have your overtime spending that's going to increase. You have um, the one-off requests. You can't repair my pumps fast enough, so I need to buy more. We need to float this inventory higher to compensate for what used to be 10 down at any given time to now 20 to 30. So now you're spending capital costs to bring more in, which is exasperating your problem because now you have more to maintain. So your technicians are seeing these newer products come in that you're asking them to do incomings on. How demoralizing is that? I mean, we can't get to it today, but here, we're gonna buy more because we're apparently not doing a good enough job, but then we're gonna have to maintain these. <laughs> um, and then increased reliance on costly support labor. So you can have an ISO come in to help and, and give you assistance. You could co add contracts. You can even go with a one-off uh, company service of, I just need, you know, spurt, you know, labor, just send in people. Um, that's great, but it comes at a higher cost. That's a premium in comparison to what your in-house expense is. If you're only gonna have someone shipped in for a month, like a traveler, for example, they have to pay a lot of overhead, so they're gonna charge you for that overhead. Makes sense as to why that's a higher cost, but it's that's not efficient. That's a great point, and and we we saw that we took on uh, one individual, and it was you know to try and help you know work down the pandemic uh, overload that we had but they were, nothing against the tech, he was great. He just didn't know the area, he didn't know our equipment. So we would have to show him, so there was a runway that we were paying to build him up at a, at a premium. Doesn't make much sense. So this kind of speaks to that, is the way I look at it is it, it's expected maintenance hours versus some available maintenance hours. So if you have uh, six technicians, the expected maintenance hours that they're spending actually repairing or maintaining equipment is roughly 80% of their time. There's documentation time, there's travel time, there's PTO, that all gets taken out of that. So we're gonna say 80% of their time of the 2080 is available for maintenance. Well, you're running six technicians, all of a sudden in the sixth month, you drop down to five. Well, your available maintenance is a combined of, or your planned predictive maintenance is combined of your correctives and your PMs. So you add that up, that's what gives you that purple line there. The green dotted line is what you're available to actually perform. So if you hit that reduction in staff, that maintenance isn't going away, it's piling up. So now every month in order, this is your available time. So you're gonna ask your staff now to try and compensate to get back to normal. But until you try and overcome those hours, you're continuing to grow an overhead of maintenance that you're trying to overcome. So the longer that takes, the worse off you are, meaning the more desperate you get to try and hire. You're going to then change your standards of hiring or you're going to spend more money on contracted services. So your costs are going to be higher because not only is that maintenance building up on you, but the safety hazards associated with it are also building. So um, that's kind of the problem of, of staff leaving, right? Um, but 
what's the anticipated growth of the field? So the federal government predicts that it's a 7% growth of the field by 2030, which they actually say is average compared to other occupations. It's typical of, of the baby boomer generation phasing out more or less. So that's estimated to be about 6,300 openings per year. And they're really associating it strongly towards the retirement not anything related to the growth of the industry, um, which we know is true. Yeah. We may not be dealing with it now, but they are still, you know, remembering those hundred hour weeks. Yeah. Stuff like that. Weeks here and there hasn't made up for the time. No, and, and there's absolutely a, a, a social conflict associated with it. Um, but medical equipment is becoming more and more complex, and we're buying more to meet more needs. So maintenance is also growing associated with that. So I honestly think that 7% is actually uh, low, lower in comparison to what it actually should be. Um, but I didn't do any research behind that. That's just my prediction. Um, the average age of technicians uh, is estimated to be 47. 30% um, are under 40, and you have nearly 50% that are over 50, with 35% of which are retiring by 2028. So there's a giant gap here of uh, essentially, you know, it's referenced by age, but it's, it's also shown in uh, talent and technique. So you have a lot more BMET ones, you have BMET 3s, radiology specialists, uh, other types of specialties, and then your BMET 2s are lacking because um, we have this gap of people being coming into the field on a, on a regular basis. So why are staffing shortages more common now because of that? So growing need for medical equipment maintenance and the retiring versus new coming in. Um, Many BMET education uh, programs have seen a reduction in enrollment, some of which so far is leading to closure. Um, there are some great uh, changes to that field, um, which you know we have online institutions that are, are coming, coming up with, with educational programs, um, hopefully making it so that more, more students are coming into that field, which is helping on that, that BMET one side, but we still have this gap. So we have to do something about you know, changing the practice by which we would fill that gap and educate people. That runway that we used to do of, you're gonna put your time in and you're gonna hit the bricks, that, that might not exist anymore. Um, so we might have to spend more training dollars right away and, you know, put, put money into the staff immediately. Uh, there's a lack of interest in the field. There's really minimal awareness of our jobs. If you go out there and you talk to somebody I mean, you can go to a bar and tell them what you do for a living. Oh, wow, that sounds really smart. That's, you know, that sounds intense. I, I don't know if I could ever do that. It's not to minimize what we do. It is intense and it's a tough field, but it's, if you have certain technical abilities and are doing things in other fields, a lot of that can apply to us just on a device. A good example is the OR. The, the video equipment in the OR, it's AV solutions. So if you've worked with audiovisual equipment in the past, you likely can handle a tower in the OR as well, or at least a good portion of it. Not all of it, you could pick up on those other things, but there's things that people just don't realize about our field, and they think it's such a scary thing. And, and students, I, I know myself when I graduated um, high school, I had no idea this existed. I thought you had to go to a four-year degree, become a biomedical engineer. And then when I got there, it's research, <laughs> it's design, it's nothing related to what we see inside hospitals. So great, wasted a lot of money, I guess. Um, but that's the challenge that, you know, if these students are aware of what you can do coming out of high school and what education you can get, and you know, do something inside hospitals that are tr that's truly meaningful, you know, and take your other talents in to help. You know, if you worked with computers, were a savvy, uh, you know, kid working on computers, or an individual who worked in IT for for a few years, you might be able to translate well into the biomed field. 
Um, but these are things that people just don't think of. One of, the, um, one of my customers, Fresenius, the dial system, they, what they've been doing the last year or so is they have such a shortage of violin hmm. that they are taking the patient texts that show an interest yeah. in working on the machines. They send them off to, to their school for training, and then they become a violin. I, I've actually seen the same thing with radiology technologists, you know, who are very tech savvy, very good with their devices, know their their device. They look to join the field because it's not direct patient care anymore. It's you know, I get to work on the device that I already know how to use. Um, it's it's coming up with creative ways to get find other avenues to pull people in. That's really what I'm getting at. Um, and lack of qualified candidates. So. With minimal students coming in, uh, the nest and having those necessary skills, what are you doing for that mid tier? What are you doing for the far end as well, other than stealing people from other institutions uh, and and a lot of poaching? So one study actually said that time to fill can be as high as nine months for some of these positions. It's it's you know definitely critical. Great resignation is absolutely real, and it the rates are highest in the technology field and the healthcare field. Well, we're both, so. <laughs> I guess that's worse. Um, so the rates are highest in those fields, uh, and a lot of it's due to the increased workload and burnout due to the pandemic. Well, we have the increased workload because the pandemic put a lot of pressure on our staff, plus the the burnout is real because we were asked to do things, to to put things in place in a rapid nature, which has never happened before, and then on top of it, you couldn't get your regular maintenance. I don't know anyone who was 100% at getting all of their available maintenance, or let me say unavailable maintenance, I guess, during the pandemic. Rooms were in use, equipment was highly utilized. So meanwhile, you just have this giant load building up all during the pandemic, and now we're finally getting through back to a state of some sense of normalcy. Well, hit the bricks, guys. We gotta, we gotta play catch up. And it, it, it's, it's a rightful shift of resources, right? Because you couldn't get the other stuff, so you, you did other things, but the challenge is it's demoralizing to the staff. So now the, the staff are seeing this pressure build and now they see this wave coming at them. I don't know about you, but I don't think anyone really wants to stand in front of a tsunami. It, it's just not a reality. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And sometimes the grass is greener on the other side type scenario, and you know it's it's not true in in every aspect. Um, the the challenge is everyone's under stress in every different industry. It exists across the board, but people aren't finding that out until it, they jump ship, and then you're left with cleaning up the mess as an employer, right? Or as a fellow technician trying to cover. Um, correct. Correct. Word of mouth definitely takes it, right? And and that's probably hurts our efforts to actually bring people into the field, right? Another um, factor that has come into this whole thing too is we've had some of our customers not very happy with us, but with what's happening is I literally have parts right now that are on three months back. Yeah. That's playing big mess now too, trying to trying to coordinate. When are we gonna fix this? Well, we gotta wait three months for this. And your technicians are under pressure. You're under pressure. Because and it's out of your control. Yeah. There's nothing you could do. Um, so confusing job titles across the industry, and I'll show you the chart, but it was three hundred and ninety-eight job postings that I reviewed to to look at, and specifically what I was looking for was the title. And I went through different ways to try and find uh, open positions in the field. And I read through all of the job descriptions to say, okay, was this title what I thought it was? So across the board for unique 
uh, names per job title. The blue bar is the unique titles that existed, and the red bar is the total that I reviewed. So for what you would refer to as a BMET 1 based on the, the job description, there was nearly 20 unique titles for that across 75 different postings. So if you, you would rather see the blue bar be almost nothing down to one with many postings because then that means you would have a one-to-one -one match. And a technician looking for a job or someone else Means, and we're just hitting the right crowd. So it takes the employer a long time and they're already at the point of being beyond frustrated when they come to us. You're tied to the schools too around the country, aren't you? Mm -hmm. yeah, we work very closely well. with Monty. Um, <laughs> we're working on uh, getting a couple more and we're even to state associations, people that are already well embedded. We're trying to advertise there and pull them. We want, as soon as a candidate to come into the industry, use us. LinkedIn is great to network, but if you're looking for a job with specific companies, healthcare employers in the industry, we want us to be your number one stop. Um, and then time to fill. Yeah, time to fill. I, although it'd be nice to have an exact, you know, one to three months, it really just depends on a variety of things. Obviously, level of experience, the location. If you're in a more remote location, it's going to take a lot longer to fill. But I think something that we've really harped on, especially you, is that the job title and the job description hold so much more weight and have played such a bigger role than I think even we anticipated when we got started on getting people to apply to that job, to fill that job. And I would say the majority of our employers that are struggling to fill a position, even with our efforts, the number one thing that they'll do is come in and change the title, change the description. And then that attracts the same people that have been looking at that listing this whole time. Now, all of a sudden, these qualified candidates are applying. So it does take a while, I would say, because of our reach, it's quicker to fill, but it's definitely a problem for sure. Yeah, and I would imagine from a recruitment recruiter perspective, you know, not having a, a standard mm -hmm. um, to go by it creates challenges. Mm -hmm. I mean, even from our HR team, they don't they'll look at the job description and they'll make best guesses at candidates that apply to the job and pass it forward to me. But you know, their best guess is is only based on that description. 
that was built, you know, maybe five years ago, 10 years ago, and, you know, might need some revision, um, or they might filter out the wrong candidates. So that's where, you know, to me, it's having that, that prepared, having those conversations with your recruiter, um, you know, ahead of time can help make their job a little bit easier because they're really only trying to help you. Um, so I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, I've worked with Southern so it's a little bit different as far as, you know, yeah. what I do. But how long before your hospital says so you really need the position? You know, if you're looking at a year, nine months you have retired, the job seems to be, in their eyes, being done. How, how often do you have to review saying? We do have a policy. For us, we have a policy to review them after a certain period of time. I believe it's like a half a year. It gets re-reviewed re for, for another approval, essentially. Um, but honestly, the way that I handle it is legitimate honesty. Uh, I show them what our numbers are. I show them you know, what it was previously, what where we're taking a hit, the safety, that the safety issues that exist around it. And no one wants to go up there and tout and say, things aren't good. And I'm in charge of it not being good. That's really a bad look if you think about it. But, you know. I mean, how do you, I mean, I know they, they do the same thing in nursing, you know, how hard it is to hire other positions. But how do you handle that? Because you can convey that it is that same issue that. Well, so. Um, you know, a lot of research, there's been a lot of uh, different articles across all the various, uh, you know, companies out there. Um, but, you know, it's a problem and, and it's drastic. So you could share those articles. You know, my hopes was doing this presentation gives you additional ammunition as well, because it was, you know, I did a lot of the research already. So you have the, the references there. Um, but that's really what it is, is, you know, it is a difficult field. It's a niche job. Um, it is hard to fill. Um, and you do have to show them that it's critically needed. Uh, I think the challenge is, you know, you may have to have that conversation, just be prepared. Uh, it depends on your institution. You know, uh, the other piece to this is when all the job titles are different and the descriptions are different, well, it's hard to grade that from a cost perspective on, on the market. Well, HR uses, you know, compensation surveys, and that's how they'll dictate whether or not a position should be paid one way or another, you know, for how much. Well, you know, there, there's a, you know, one big survey that comes out every year that's really nice. Everyone wants to throw that down and say, see, I'm not making enough. You go to HR with that, it's publicly sourced data, doesn't matter, I'm not using it. Absolutely true. And they're absolutely right. Anyone can put that a number in there. Anyone can float it high. It's not 100% truthful. There's no guarantee behind it. It's not like it's you're required to submit a pay stub when you do that, right? So they rely on their surveys with good reason. It's source data from people, from institutions that are willing to participate to gain access to data as well. It's a sharing initiative. The challenge is those companies are tasked with matching up the job descriptions or the job titles with what they have on file to try and normalize everything across the board. Well, if everyone is separate and everyone has something different and they call an apple an orange, how are they gonna match that up well? So it creates a discrepancy from a market perspective and it also creates a challenge. So if they're looking at cohorts, maybe in your local area and you only have five or six other hospitals there, but everyone titles it differently. Well, the one with the most staff might dominate that survey and might be the only per, the only institution that actually has data in there because they, there are triggers. They're not gonna provide data back if there was only five. Well, in our field, how many rad techs do you have or radiology engineers do you have in your department? That cohort is very small. So that may not actually trigger the survey, which may not ever be represented in the data, which then gives you issues when you're trying to grade the position. All these things cascade. Um, so you all try to normalize the job titles with various things or you try to get something that comes to you and say, you know, I know you're calling it this, however, that whole industry is more of this, that way, you know, at least you have one focal point to 
Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of times we work with HR who once they'll send us over the title description and we'll make sure that it's, you know, run through the director of the department, make sure that's what they're exactly looking for. Because a lot of times they'll dismiss some resumes that come through because it's not exactly what they think they're looking for, but it could be a perfect fit. Almost like in certain forms, you need to add more job descriptions. You don't hashtag HTM, hashtag vertical. Just, just to get the search engine to even market. Yeah, you're right. No, you're absolutely right. And but that that's great on the job posting, not so good on the survey. So uh, it also creates an issue with students. How are they ever going to get interest in the field if no one can figure out what to call ourselves? You know, they're from the educational perspective, we're trying to design and run programs that are specifically to meet this industry's needs. And the, the, the tools that we can utilize are the same tools that he did to connect with students. We look at the job requirements, we look at the clients we talk to the, the mm -hmm. hiring students. If there's no you know consistency, then how do you design learning objective type programs that yeah. graduate students that are ready to go to work when they show up at your doorstep? It's very true. So we have like a responsibility to the industry to try to get this right, to try to establish some consistency. And every company is going to be a little unique, right? But in general, there's some general consistencies and frameworks that we can establish that's critical. Yeah. We we um we had a great success hiring the college students that came through the biomed program at Portland Community College. The instructor and I we worked together for 30 years in a hospital. So I made sure that the test equipment that he was training them on was the test equipment we were using in C group. So that when I hired one of his people right out of college, they could do safety checks, they could do the basic that a tech one would do. I didn't have to go mm -hmm. and have them shadow, they could right away go do safety checks, they could check the equipment out. Now the downside is COVID killed the program. The of course. program has not come back. And so and but here, I, I have a philosophy that my boss taught me back in the 1970s. I don't expect you to work for me forever. I expect you to advance in your career. And I use that with the students. I know that the hospital are not going to take them on because they have no experience. They're going to, they, they, and because they, they're paying such at a high level, mm -hmm. they want experience. So come to work for me. I've seen you know the basics. Work for me for a couple of years. And four of my people, including the one that worked for me for six years, she got a job at a hospital in Salem close to her. Mm -hmm. Her dad had some health issues. So she went down there. I, I, I have no regrets. She did a wonderful job mm -hmm. for me. I'm glad to see she's now a tech three and she's a certified biomed tech. And she came out of that college program. And to me, those. The college program. Those are great wins, right? And, and it feels good from an institution perspective to pump someone into the field because it's needed desperately across the board. I mean, we make it very easy on Monty and his team. So, you know, he... <laughs> but, you know, this is where we need to work together as, as, a, as an aggregate group, whether it be regionally, across the nation, whatever it, whatever it is, we should be reviewing things to come up with a, a better strategy just because we're competing so much more. Um, Portland and Seattle are paying five thousand dollar bonuses yeah. for experienced biomeds. And that's it. That's if someone wants to continue being a biomed or go into the field. And I could tell you I have a friend who works from home, completely remote, will never want to go back to his old job of going into the office. The competition, the game has changed. It, it's a lot more competitive. So we gotta advance our, our tactics. Um, so what what should the job titles be? Uh, should we conform to a region, a state title? Should we adopt titles based on national organizations like the VA? Should we adopt titles used by the Department of Labor, medical equipment repairer, and just use that across the board? Um, do we adopt what's used on the HR compensation surveys, try to match what they're doing so that we'll get better data? Um, do we adopt the titles that were created by Amy a few years back on their career print? career planning handbook um they're really open questions you know it's i don't think there is one right answer right now i think it's a it's a question of you know what suits your needs best at the moment but the challenge with that is we're just continuing to cascade the problem right when we were using biomed biomedical technicians in our advertising we would get a whole bunch of people from the clinical 
my mm -hmm. own industry, the ones that want to work in research and labs. Yep. They didn't realize that we were looking for a new technology. So that that's one of the things about our nomenclatures and our and our, what we call ourselves. The University of Pennsylvania Biomedical Engineering Program is genetic engineering and, and five candidates went there. Yeah. Looking for an entry level job because they thought it was a great externship expansion of their degree program. And it's it's a waste of their time, it's a waste of ours. I mean, I, I as much as I like to educate them, but they've already gone down a whole nother path and they're not going to deviate. Right, so uh, it, it's it's a tough position to be in. So here I, I put up the Amy definition of a BMET one. Um, to this is what I used in my research to say as I'm reviewing these descriptions, what where it falls in line with. Uh, total number of job postings were 75 plus 23 that were kind of questionable. Um, total number of unique names were 20 plus nine questionable. And the HR compensation survey names, which I want you to you know, keep this in the back of your mind as we continue on, biomedical electronics technician in one survey and biomedical equipment technician in another survey. That represented the BMET1 cohort. So across the board, biomedical technician one had the most job postings associated with that title, then followed by BMET1. Then you had biomedical equipment technician one, and then it trailed off. So going over here, this is durable medical technician bed tech. Well, good luck finding a person for that. They have to know that title very specifically. Uh, clinical support engineer, you're not matched up. So if you're not matching what's common out there, it's gonna be very hard for you to get that candidate. So BMET2, um, again, there's the Amy job, post, or job description. Total number of job postings found were 84 plus 34 questionable. And I'll, I'll show you guys the questionable and what I mean by that a little bit later. Total number of unique names were 16 plus 14 questionable. And the compensation survey was biomedical electronics technician and biomedical equipment technician, same as pure BMET one. So biomedical technician two uh, had the most um, you know, frequently used title for that position. About 40 of those, nearly, uh, were labeled there. Biomedical equipment technician two was next, and BMET two was followed. Down here, you have a medical services technician. You have a clinical engineer tech two, BMET. That's going to be hard for that person to find those jobs. So as an employer, you're really setting yourself behind. And again, this is nationally, but you know, if someone's trying to find a job in your you know, maybe one off state here, would they find that on Indeed? Maybe. And I took all this data from HTM jobs that existed as well as from Indeed, everything that existed in February, essentially. BMET 3, uh, there's the Amy job description. Total number of job postings found were 49, plus five questionable, 15 unique names, and two questionable. Again, the popular compensation survey names were the same. So we're really, you know, building that market data to give a wide range. The BMET 3, uh, so biomedical technician 3 was used the most. It seems like biomedical technician was the most frequent one that existed out there. Um, but it's also possible that one organization uh, posted the most at that time. Uh, that could be floating that data, so it's not flawless by any means. Uh, biomedical Equipment Technician 3 was next, then BMET 3. Again, we have down here, Senior Biomedical Equipment Technician, Biomedical Equipment Technician slash Anesthesia. It's gonna be hard for them to find it. Um, anesthesia, if they search, they might key on that, but it's tough. When you put this in the titles, you gotta remember, remember, uh, remember how the algorithms are searching. So, and what people might be keyed on. The hashtag, great idea. It's something that you can do to help. Uh, for equipment, biomedical equipment technician specialists focused on radiology, there is the Amy description. Uh, total found was 64 with 70, 17 unique names. And again, biomedical electronics technician, biomedical equipment technician. I don't know how many of you have tried to hire a RAD specialist before, but when I've given that resume to HR, 
and they run it up against the survey, they look at years and where that person should be sitting against the median. Well, that's not appropriate because if they're being graded against a BMAT 1 in the same cohort, that range is too big. That median is not accurate associated with that position. So that's something that's hard to fight against. Not having a proper title for these individuals puts them at a disadvantage, puts you at a disadvantage for making a competitive offer and for keeping your staff and retention efforts. So most common title used was image, imaging engineer and followed by imaging service engineer. We have x-ray service engineer, specialist imaging two, and the tail end radiology service engineer two. Those might still get some views, but you're not matched up with what's most commonly used. So again, you're setting yourself back. Other, um, other specialist positions, network and laboratory. For network, we had five that were found. Nearly every one of them had a different name. And again, you're still matched up against your electronics technicians, your equipment technicians, so why wouldn't they be matched up against someone in IT? That would be more appropriate. Um, you're not gonna compete for that talent, I guess. Uh, that's, that's the way that I look at it. Um, laboratory, there were three, and all three had different names. And again, still matched up against, which may be appropriate for that group, I'm not sure. Clinical engineer, so more on the project side of things. There was a total number of job postings found that were eight. Uh, unique names were six. Almost all of them were, were separate. There is no um, name for them in the, the survey samples that I, I saw. So the best descriptors that would make sense against this description would be operations project manager or an IT project manager. But Likely, they're going to get graded against your biomedical equipment technician or maybe a biomedical engineer that works fee, uh, research um, or at educational institutions. Not appropriate for that individual. So you're sending yourself back and you know, trying to hire that person. Will they stay? Will, will you retain that, the, those individuals um, you know, competing with other institutions? They might grade them differently. So. For the engineer, the most common title was biomedical engineer uh, with three, but then it went biomed engineer and clinical engineer mix, the biomedical engineer slash clinical engineer trying to capture both, which I think is a good idea. It's a, it's a good way to bridge everything. Clinical systems engineer, a variety of titles. So some notable findings for field service. There was a total of 37 with 23 different unique titles. Um, most common was field service engineer, but then you had field clinical engineer, and then you had some specific ones to field technical equip, field technical engineer, imaging field service engineer three, uh, senior field clinical engineer. And their play is on each other, but it's still going to be hard for, for you to find the right candidate or the right candidate to find you. For the BMAT one questionables, so. The reason why I question marked these was because when I looked at the title, there was no indication to me that that's a BMET one. So biomedical technician, there was 11 of those. When you read that though, it was actually a BMET one in the, in the job description. Uh, clinical engineer, there were two. You're capturing the completely wrong base if you post it that way. So it's, it's a challenge. Uh, again, you're not capturing the right candidates. BMET 2, we had again biomedical equipment technician, but the job description was specific to a 2. So how are they going to find that person to fill those roles? I mean, if a person clicks on that and they read it, it's a lot more effort. And I, I think I mentioned earlier today, I mean, people are of the Tinder mindset, swipe left, swipe right. I want it fast. I, I don't want to do effort. Um, and the same thing goes for job searching. Um, Biomedical equipment technician, this kind of spacing it all out, there was uh, four questionable for one, there was 13 for two, specialist imaging, and specialist IT. Those are the Amy titles that that job posting actually referenced in the description. That's what it would have been. So how are you going to get a specialist in IT if you're only posting biomedical equipment technician? You're never gonna find the person. 
uh, biomedical technician, similar, BMET 1, 1, 2, it spanned across. Biomedical engineer, spanned across 1s, 2s, and clinical engineers. So how can this be solved for, for my current posting? I'm still good on time? Yeah, OK. Um, revise the current posting uh, title to match most, most commonly used in your area. Do some research. Look at what other hospitals in your local area are using. Talk with them. I mean, don't ask for how much you're paying your people. Just ask, what's the titles you're using? Try to normalize locally so that you can all help each other that you know when your staff want to you know no one wants to lose staff but if they know what they're called and it's local used everywhere then it's going to help you it's also going to help you benchmark yourself against each other so it's not to to aid in poaching it's to aid in your efforts for retention because it helps with your pay scales uh, when it comes to the market analysis and it also helps for bringing new people in they know what to look for um, Revise the description of the job to be descriptive of what you are actually looking for. Don't leave it as something nondescript. People will get confused they, if they even read it. Um, it, help, it doesn't help your recruiter whatsoever leaving it nondescript. It means more work for you to have a conversation now, which is still good to do. It's a best practice, but you know, you're not always going to handhold them. You're not going to have time to talk to your recruiter every day and say, I want this, I don't want that. If you're more descriptive off the bat, it's better for you. Uh, widen your range for your job postings. Don't lock yourself in. So if you're looking for a BMET 4, you should really be having a serious conversation internally and saying, how can I shift my resources because I may not find that BMET 4. And let me post in a fashion where it's biomedical equipment technician 124 so that I could capture as many resumes and have that decision now based across candidates and say, I have these candidates laid out for twos. This person would mesh well with my team because it's not just, a, it's not just an aspect of their technical abilities, there's also the aspect of actually working together. And now you frame that conversation back to yourself of what work can I shift around? Um, so you might have to get creative. Uh, that's the field right now. Hire a recruiting service, whether it be passive, uh, assistive, or an active service. So what I mean by that, passive would be, you know, doing Indeed posting, um, doing social media platforms like HTM Jobs team does. You know, that's a great passive way. They post it and it sits out there, right? There's a little bit of effort on them, but it's not something where they're having to go out there and seek people constantly. Assistive. That's kind of where I would refer to your team services as, you know, they will go out there and they will try to grab candidates that are already on their site and try to match it with what they have for the posting. And they'll do that work against the database that they're already having, leveraging their capabilities, but it's not a full-blown recruiting service, right? It's not like they're out there trying to poach. They're posting something, maybe getting some interest in it, and they're getting candidates from their own database that they've already applied to them to say, here's my resume, keep it on file. I mean, that was the old school days, right? You wanted a job somewhere, you would stop by, talk to the manager and say, here's my resume, I know you don't have an opening. That's what that is. That's the new age version of it because we don't have the time for that and we don't have the people that are doing it anymore. So, you know, people are going to provide their resumes to groups to just say, keep this on file. And, I'm open to ideas in the future, just let me know. Active service would be paying that premium for, for an actual recruiting service to go out there and find that specific talent that you need. But you're going to pay for that. It's a substantial cost and it may take them time because realistically, if it's specialized, they're going to have to t look for somebody out there who has a job already and you're competing against that person's organization's retention efforts of keeping that employee, as well as now trying to court somebody. So that's a challenge. So 
how can this be avoided in the future? I did this giant Venn diagram to show because in my mind, this is this is across the board. It ha this should be starting now when you don't have a problem or while you have a problem. <laughs> um, so prevention, work on retention strategies. Come up with ideas of how can I continue to retain my staff? You know, if that's a money thing, talk to your HR about a market compensation survey and make sure you understand that data. If it's a, you know, a workload thing, come up with ways to try to address that workload differently. Uh, one of the things that we did with our staff, a common complaint that we got back in our surveys is that they feel like we don't use their talents well enough that we're making them do things that are that anyone else could do. A good example is changing batteries on a thermometer. So I have a seasoned tech that has to go into rooms and find these thermometers. It spends a lot of their time. It's a waste of his time because I could actually have him spending effort and time on something that's more important. But compliance dictates what I got to do. And I have to meet those numbers because it's still important. Not having batteries in the thermometer, you know, it's going to create a nursing challenge. There's reasons why we do that. And that you can have the conversation, try to make them understand that. But you're fighting an uphill battle. So what we did was we hired uh, an individual from transport and we said, okay, we're going to use you to help change our batteries. You know the institution, you know where everything is. You can change a double A battery. I think a lot of people can. Um, and correct, it's not direct patient care anymore. And it, it he doesn't have a background in the field whatsoever. It potentially creates an avenue now of somebody else coming into the field that is interested because they're going to have downtime. There's going to be time where they can't get into rooms, they can't find the equipment because it's a lot of legwork. You know, all that lower end equipment trying to search is, is a really the reason why no one else wants to do it. Uh, they would rather be doing those more complex repairs. So what you can now do is when that person has downtime, if you're interested in learning more, tag along. Learn that more complex repair. I'm not saying you're going to ever do that right away, but gain an interest. If you want to go back to school, we'll send you to school. And if it does a good job, you can graduate them to final basic blood pressure. Correct. So it creates a feeder avenue for yourself. So um, that would be from a pre prevention strategy. Um, come up with ways to make your staff happy, make them want to stay. Uh, be prepared because there's, there's an avenue in which someone will always leave, whether it be retirement or, or another opportunity. So work with local organizations to create a common title in your area because this again will help you. It's going to help you find candidates. If someone is interested in leaving another organization and they call themselves a BMET2 there, then shouldn't you be calling the same type of person a BMET2 or a BMET3 for the next avenue? Because that's, that's the challenge. How are they going to find your job posting? If they're calling them a, a clinical engineer two, and that's all the person knows because maybe they, they're not as savvy with the field, didn't do their research, will they find your job posting? I'm going to look for the same title that I already had. Um, so that's a challenge. So, you know, trying to normalize will help you uh, resist that challenge. Um, the salaries will also be easier to grade, which will help you on the retention side of things and, and preventing people from leaving um, and allowing the compensation surveys to match in your, your given area. So strictly on preparedness, um, be prepared for that turnover creating that succession planning. So like what we did with that one individual, it was bringing someone in on the low end of the field to gain some interest. It also freed up some time for our less senior tech, but you know, that have been there for a little bit to now let me migrate them to another technology. Let me get them prepared just in case that senior individual leaves. I have someone now ready that has a familiarity Maybe not a perfect understanding, but they understand what the tech is. And maybe I've already gotten them trained as a backup because they showed interest and I, I, I wanted to foster that interest. Um, do an educational gap analysis. Look at where your holes are. If you don't have a contract on something today and you don't have anyone trained on it, 
but it's something that should require training, that's a high risk. It's a great opportunity to get someone trained on it and foster a little bit of uh, giving back to the staff. If you have things that only one person is trained on, that's a big risk. That, that creates a flight risk for your institution. If you put all your eggs in one basket, that means you better be prepared when that person tries to leave. That's gonna be a major retention effort. And you better make sure that person's happy and they're not looking to, to leave. Um, so you can... You, you had a tag, uh, this is years ago, you went through training for the, the care home mm -hmm. stuff. You came back and resigned because the company never... Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We, at that time, there was no regulations that said if you go to school, you gotta pay us back within 20 years. So, and, you know, some states that's not legal either so it's you know the challenge with that is real but hedging your bets making that more spanned out it keeps your staff happy it also allows you that opportunity to be prepared it limits your risk for when you have to deal with it and maybe it limits that cost that you're going to see on having a contract out for a temporary position or a temporary time um, you don't want to have to do that with your full inventory. You don't want to put patients at risk because no one on your staff is familiar with that 50% of the inventory. So you're then stuck on a very difficult management decision. Do we pay the premium for the safety? Or do I say, eh, jump into the fire, figure it out? It's a challenge because that and your staff aren't particularly happy with that either. Um, and just in case, be prepared with the contracts. Some equipment, very easy to contract, very easy to call time and materials on. Some companies don't have a service division. There is no time and materials for that, or it's send out only. So you're having to ship a bunch of pumps out because they're not going to send a field tech in. So that creates that inventory challenge. Well, identify companies that provide supplemental service in your area. Put them, you know, come up with a contract with them. You don't have to use them ever. Just, I want to lock in my rates and I want to be able to reach out to you when I need it. Because that can happen at any given time. Be prepared to pull that trigger. Don't let that, that giant slope I showed earlier creep up on you to the point where it's insurmountable because then you're going to get morale issues with your team and then safety issues and all those other challenges. So kind of leading into response, creating that pipeline doing like what we did with, uh, with the gentleman from transport, Come, doing an internship, working with your local schools, um, doing the Amy apprenticeship. They have a new program that's a great avenue of putting people into the field. HTM in a box, use that. Go to uh, local high schools, middle schools, talk to them about it, show them the ROI of this field. Debt is a big topic of conversation right now, Excuse me, and many people don't want debt. This is a great field to get into that has a low cost to jump in and has a high return. And honestly, is there even cost that the hospital is gonna pay it? So why go to a four year program, build up hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt to only try and join this field later after? Your timeline from a life perspective might be different. It might take you six years to get that bachelor's, but if it takes you six years, you were making money the whole time, and you have zero debt, frames the conversation entirely differently. So where are our best advocates in talking to the local schools? That also helps build that pipeline. It gets them interested. And they know that you, from that institution, came and talked to them. I, I want to go and work for Middlesex because, you know what, they were really down to earth. They pointed me in the direction response when that person does leave and now you have to deal with it don't wait too long to get a recruitment service it's right now things are so dire you can end up in a desperate position very easily so you know you can work with your hr team do the indeed posting that's fine but don't let it sit out there too long if you feel like you're not getting any bites you're not getting any good candidates jump up the ladder Go to a more um, assistive-based approach. Get out of the passive mindset. Go to the, you know, to me, it's, it's stepping through that process of how desperate you're willing to get because everything comes at a cost. 
So, you know, filter out what that cost is going to be to you and how long you're willing to wait for this position and try to minimize that time. So having this plan ahead of time is again, everyone is going to deal with this at some point in time. If you think that you are going to hold your staff as they are today for the next year, two years, three years, God bless you. <laughs> but uh, I got some things I'd love to sell you, I guess. 